Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for painting the event over the great weather outside. <laughs> Uh, I think maybe more people will come in. Can you talk louder? No, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I can. But this is supposed to do the job. I don't know why I should do any more effort. Um, so before uh, I start with, the, with some details, I'd like to acknowledge first that we are on um, and see the Coast Salish territory, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I uh, mean, in the large context of what we're discussing today, uh, this matters. Um, this is my second year here, and I met uh, Professor Ahmed last year, and he told me about his forthcoming book, and we decided to do a book, kind of a book launch event. But we decided not to do it in a very traditional way, which is, you know, he comes here, he gives a lecture, you ask questions, you leave. We're trying to imagine something else, where it's more of an engagement with you, and also where he's kind of quizzed, rather than to just have a high stage for him. By then, I had met uh, Hanif Karim, and I was mentioning this event to, uh, to Hanif, and he said, why don't you do it in this format? And I said, yeah, uh, you see what format. <laughs> and I, yeah, that's a good idea. And I'm thinking, who the moderator would be? And it took me like two weeks, like, he should be the moderator. <laughs> First he came up with the idea, and he reads a lot of books, a lot of them. And, um, and then we met, the three of us, plus uh, Rumi's part. Aisha there, and we were thinking about the details, and we decided to invite Professor Sarah Tontawi to take part uh, in this uh, event and in the conversation. And this is what we're going to have here, a conversation. Um, I'm going first to introduce, one side, I love this, uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Rumi Ahmed. Do you know him? <laughs> Everybody knows him? <laughs> uh, he's associate dean at the Faculty of Arts and uh, Faculty of Arts only. That's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's more than that. Uh, at the University of British Columbia and associate professor of Islamic law. His writing and the research span religion, law, philosophy, and hermeneutics. I don't know what he means by that, but that's what I found on his website. And he has been traveling a lot. I don't have the chance to you know, kind of ask him to give me more information. And uh, his new book is Sharia Compliant, A User's Guide to Hacking Islamic Law. It was published by Stanford University Press 2018. And he's also the author of Narratives of Islamic Legal Theory, published in 2012 at the, by the Oxford University Press. He's the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Islamic Law. It's the story of the Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> up and coming. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> and also he edited, oops, that's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a regular commentator for international policy organizations. Thank you. You're going to have a hard time here. I know that this is this is how this is going to happen. Um, our second guest is Professor Sarah Tantawi, Associate Professor of Comparative Religion at the Berkeley State College, and an analyst of the Muslim majority world on major media outlets. She's the author of Sharia on Trial in Northern Nigeria's Islamic Revolution, uh, University of California 2017, and you can see the overlap and why Professor Tantau more specifically is, is joining us to do this. And our moderator is Hanif Karim. He's the Human Rights, Equity, and Health Policy Officer for the British Columbia and Out of Breath Nurses Union. That's a really long, uh, you know, is this a title? Yeah. And he's also completing an MA in Gerontology at Simon Fraser University. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Amal Ghazal, and I'm the director of the Center for Comparative Muslim Studies that's organizing and hosting uh, this event. Um, 
We'll start by actually ha um, with Hanif having a conversation with Professor Mahmoud, and then Hanif having a conversation with Professor Tantawi, and then moderating a conversation between both of them, and then Hanif has some questions for you. I hope I got this right. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter what I said. <laughs> what I know is this is going to be kind of a unique event. And uh, unique in the format and unique in terms of what we're trying to do here. This is a very important topic for everybody. And uh, as you know, the whole issue of Islamic law, Sharia, has been dominant, uh, especially after the uh, collapse of the Ottoman order and the rise of the nation state. Uh, in, uh, it's, it, it, it took different meanings in different shapes and forms uh, in the modern period. Uh, I'm happy that we're having this conversation. I'll end here. Thank you for coming again, and I'll get back to you later. Thank you. And thanks very much to Professor Fazal for inviting me to do this. Um, I have to say that initially, when I was uh, asked to do this, even though I, you know, I had, had some ideas about how this event might unfold. Uh, the thought of having to read a book about uh, Islamic law and the Sharia in the summer um, <laughs> wasn't particularly compelling. As you know, you know, summer. If you're a reader, summer is a time for books that are less demanding, that have a kind of nice narrative flow about them that you can pull out on the beach or the bus without having to have a brown paper bag over them, you know. <laughs> um, but as I, uh, when I received the book, um, I was not compelled by the cover, let me just say. But as I, uh, and, and you know what, what's interesting, I, I know, I know, you have, I know, and authors have nothing to do with the cover. But what's interesting about the cover is that it actually uh, get, tells you nothing about the way in which uh, the narrative flows. It's, it's a really eloquently written book. And of course, I'm sure you've been to events where you know, the moderator has to say something nice. But this, in this case, uh, this is quite genuine. It was a, both a demanding read, but a read that uh, has a lot of eloquence to it, a lot of transparency, a, a real flow. It's engaging. I read it in cafes, I read it on the bus, I read it during um, breaks at work, sitting outside in the scorching sun. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a very uh, compelling read. So it's a real privilege to get a chance to uh, sit with you here and, and talk a little bit about this work. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could just begin by um, saying a little bit about what uh, compelled you to, to write this. And, um, how uh, the work fits in with your professional interests and, and your life interests. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much for those kind words. And also thank you everyone for being here, Professor Bazal and uh, Professor Al-Bantawi for being here. Uh, and of course for our host, the Coast Salish people. Um, and you know, I just want to take a moment to say to Professor Bazal, like you've been here for two years. And oh, thank you. Thank you. One, <laughs> one year and two months, which makes it even more impressive. What I was about to say was that you have, our community has benefited so much from your being here. And you've been able to create community uh, where we didn't realize there was any uh, in such a short time. Uh, and for me especially, this community aspect is so important because I, I grew up in the Muslim community in, outside of DC, one of the Muslim communities there. I love my community. Uh, it gave me identity, uh, I, I had friends there, and you know, I, I was always at the masjid, always at the mosque. I loved Islamic sciences, especially love the Quran. I was always reading the Quran, I loved the messages of it, I loved reciting it. And, uh, and I, I got involved in Muslim community organizations, and I wanted to be a Muslim scholar. Like, I wanted to go to the Muslim world, you know, the quote unquote Muslim world, and go become a, a, a scholar, particularly of the Quran. So, I went, and I went to several uh, centers of learning, and everywhere I went, I was like, I want to learn Quran. They're like, no, no, you don't, we don't do that. Like, you don't learn Quran, you learn law. 
And you know, at each place, it's like, no, no, first you do law. Maybe later you'll do Quran. And you know, when people were generous, they'd at least say, the Quran is so has is open to so many interpretations that it's actually dangerous if you start with the Quran. You have to start with the law first so that you can know how to apply the Quran. So they fine, you know, whatever, I'll do all. So we I did law and the way you learn law um, is that you uh, you know they teach you a book, it's like a kind of a short book, and then you read a commentary on that book, and then an abridgment of the commentary, and then a commentary on the abridgment. And the books get bigger and bigger and bigger, and by the end of it, you kind of know it inside and out. And you know, like law is it's interesting and it's kind of easy. Like it's not actually very the, the books are dense, but it's not very hard. And especially if you grew up in the community, you kind of know things intuitively. So I was really good at it. Um, and I did really well, but I really wanted to study Quran. And by the time I was, you know, you, you learn law, then you learn aqidah, um, the, like creed, theology, then you learn hadith, then you learn usul, legal theory, then you learn Quran. So like by the time I got to Quran, they were like, yeah, we don't really have any teachers who do that. Um, if you want, you can read some books or stuff. But, because uh, nobody really cares. So anyway, so I got really good at law, and I came back to North America, and I realized like how weird that setting is. And I mean like weird in a literal sense, like strange, odd, that, that learning setting where I was with these people and we were studying these books of law that mostly don't apply, and we kind of created this bubble around us that was awesome while you were in it, but very, very strange. And you come here and you realize most Muslims don't care. Uh, most Muslims don't aren't really that interested in Islamic law. Most Muslims don't go to the mosque. Most Muslims don't apply Islamic law in any meaningful way in their in their lives. And, and they're not like broken up about it. It's not that they're bad Muslims. It's just that that's not how they express their religiosity. And I realized how that community that I grew up in was actually pretty marginal. Like we we don't represent in mosque communities most Muslims. We have this like odd little little thing that we do. And another thing that I noticed was how, not only how exclusive it was, but how exclusionary it was. Like we, uh, it, it is a, a, a practice of privileged individuals that is self-perpetuates this kind of privilege and exclusion, uh, is, especially of women, um, but also many other marginalized groups. And I, I started noticing that, I wish I could say it was because like I'm so woke <laughs> like, I'm so observant, but the, the truth is I got, uh, I, I met my partner who is herself an Islamic scholar, and you, you can't miss it, like the way that uh, women are treated differently in our community uh, for no other reason than perceived ideas about gender. And you, you start seeing all the different ways in which different groups are excluded and certain groups are privileged. And the wonderful experience I had growing up in the Muscat was because I was a male. And I had access to all parts of, of the mosque. Uh, and, and you real like, when you see the people you love um, hurt by a system, you, you kind of can't unsee that. It's a, it's a cliche, I you know, like to be like, oh, you know, when I had a daughter, that's when I started respecting women. But, you know, I'm not proud of it, I, I'm embarrassed by it, but that's the truth, that's, that's what happened. Um, and it raises questions about if we're this like exclusive, small group of people who perpetuate this type of privilege, where is the authority? And what is the function of Islamic law? Like if Islamic law does not embody that kind of justice and beautiful soaring rhetoric that you read in the Quran, what is it? Is it right? Is it wrong? And where, where does authority lie? Should it be with this small group of people, or should it be with the community at large? And I think that when Islamic law serves to exclude the majority of Muslims, something is wrong. And some, something's not wrong with Muslims, something's wrong with the way that we're doing Islamic law. So like, um, there was a poll recently uh, that came out in North America that most North American Muslims have no problem with homosexuality. They believe the actual question was, should homosexuality be an accepted practice? And the majority of Muslims said, yeah. So for me, that's where the authority lies, with our community. I trust our community and I love our community. And if I'm gonna choose between Islamic law, like as it's normally interpreted in these small spaces, or between what our community believes is justice, I'm gonna go with the justice part. And when you look back at the way that 
Islamic law, like the way that I studied it, where you, you have these books and these commentaries and the abridgments of the commentaries, that's what they were doing, actually. They weren't just like making a commentary and explaining it dryly. They were saying, here's how, here's what our beliefs are now. What that original author really meant was X, Y, and Z. And then someone comes a couple hundred years later and says, this great scholar from the past wrote this. What they really meant was A, B, and C. And that way you link yourself to this ancient tradition while being able to uh, be part of a contemporary society. And that's actually, for me, that's the miracle of Islamic law. That it can apply, and the miracle of the Quran for that matter, is that it gives meaning and it applies in different places, in different contexts over 1400 years, so that many of us in this room feel comfortable saying that we follow Islamic law, even though this gathering goes against literal readings of most classical Islamic textbooks, just by the fact that there are men and women sitting side by side. But we don't really think about that. We don't think that we're violating Islamic law. We have found ways to make Islamic law give meaning to us in, in this day and age. And so what I wanted to do with this, with this book is to say that for our ideas of justice, whenever they go against the ideas of those who are privileged, those who are privileged are not going to reinterpret the law on their own. We have to speak in an authoritative voice, to speak back to them, to say, no, actually, this is what we believe about what justice looks like today, and express those beliefs in the language of Islamic law. So that we can say, you know, I'm not a bad Muslim for believing in gender equality. I'm a good Muslim. And in fact, I can show you how gender equality is enshrined in the legal texts going all the way back to the Prophet. And it was the Prophet's intent to put people upon justice and to break down barriers and to take those who are privileged and place us all on an equal plane. And so if I'm going to sum it up, that's what I was hoping to do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, part of what we want to do in this opening segment is just to kind of orient you to the to the text, um, so that when this um, the, the third part of this will be uh, an opportunity for discussion amongst yourselves, and then uh, the opportunity to ask questions. But we want to really ground you in some of the key themes. So, with that in mind, um, I, I just I want to get you to dive into chapter one, and um, just tell us, you know, chapter so chapter one is entitled. Uh, what is Sharia? What is Islamic law? What is hacking? And I'm wondering if we, we can take the first two concepts, and if you can just give us a working definition of Sharia and, and Islamic law. Sure. Like, but again, you write quite beautifully about about these two uh, phenomena. Thank you. So, oh, sure, no problem. Uh, so, the Sharia is a concept that links human beings to God, and the the Sharia has no fixed content. It is that good action which links humans and their societies to godliness. And so everyone has their own conception of Sharia. Um, for some people, it might look like a, a utopian communist socialist state. For others, it might look like uh, more of an autocratic state. For other people, it has nothing to do with the state at all. It involves being a good person. Uh, for some people, their Sharia is you know, uh, Sufi uh, devotion. And for a small subsection, I shouldn't say a small subsection, for a, for a significant minority of the Muslim population, the way that they express their visions of a good, of good life and good society is through a language known as fiqh, Islamic law. And throughout the centuries, Muslims and Muslim scholars have tried to capture their vision of Sharia in books of Islamic law. And these books of Islamic law look vastly different in different times and different places. They generally tend to follow the same kind of structure, but the content of them uh, shifts according to time and place. Um, <clears throat> I want to just give folks a flavor of, of you know, how you write, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can um, read from, from the book, um, I don't read pages 32 and 33. Do you have a call from memory? Recitation of the Thank you. So pages 32 and 33, um, <coughs> beginning from I guess it would have been around the same. Oh, same. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll publish it. The reality is that all of us, Muslim or not, have nuanced and at times hypocritical relationships with law. We are somehow able to tout the law's importance and flout it at the same time. We can follow the law in some ways and disobey it in others and still consider ourselves good citizens. The next time you catch yourself texting while driving, Think of a Muslim scholar who enjoys occasional drink, of which there are many, believe me. A complicated relationship with the law is a fact of life in all societies. Understanding that fifth-minded Muslims, so I call people who value the language of Islamic law, fifth-minded Muslims, like everyone else, have varied relationships with the law, is key to understanding how Islamic law functions in Muslim life. This understanding will help us see that conversations about Sharia and Islamic law are deeply human enterprises, and not the exclusive purview of a select group of religious, disconnected, irrational actors. Conversations about Sharia mirror conversations about any value that people hold dear, and we will see that there are many analogs to Islamic law in purportedly secular systems. We all have values that we believe in, and some of us try to express those values in legal language. Often those attempts are messy and inconsistent, requiring us to speak from within an existing legal framework in order to have authority. In the same way, Sharia is a value that many Muslims hold dear, and fifth-minded Muslims try to express that value in the language of Islamic law. When they do, they have to work within an existing legal framework if their expressions are to have authority, and it sometimes gets messy. This book is designed, therefore, not only to introduce you to the internal language of Islamic law, but to immerse you in the ways in which Islamic law is used to express changing and competing conceptions of the Sharia. We will learn about the basic requirements for engaging in legal debates, and about how legal arguments must be presented in order to gain authority. We will learn how Muslim legal scholars have historically worked within an existing Islamic legal tradition to hack laws so that they reflect changing times, mores, and beliefs about the Sharia while staying true to ancient historical roots. We will look at instances in which hacks are accepted and in which they are rejected so that we can appreciate how social, political, and economic interests can determine a hack's success or failure. Finally, once we understand how hacking worked in the past and how it works in the present, we will examine how laws can be hacked in the future. None of this is possible, however, unless we are able to entertain complex notions about Muslims, Sharia, and Islamic law. It will be tempting to equate Sharia with Islamic law or to fall back on one of the myths discussed earlier. Doing so will return us to a polarized situation in which we can only speak about Islamic law instead of speaking within Islamic law. In other words, we will only be able to describe Islamic law. We will not be able to hack it. So throughout this book, please keep in mind that Sharia is a claim space, that Islamic law is an attempt to capture the Sharia in legal language, and that Muslims, well, Muslims are complicated people, just like everyone else. If you do, by the end of this book, you will be able to hack Islamic law to express your own claims about the Sharia and harness its power as a redemptive force in the world. I want to just um, close this section by picking up on something that you that you read, um, and this is the line uh, that references how Muslim legal scholars have historically worked within an existing legal Islamic legal tradition to hack laws, and to ask you to say a little bit about what you mean by, by hacking. Yeah. And sure. um, and and maybe to um, in the book you, you have a, a somewhat um, tragic and, and at the same time amusing reference to missing husbands in, in India, and if you could, um, so say a little bit about hacking, and then just give that example maybe um, as a way of illustrating how that process works. Sure, yeah, so the, the, the missing husbands thing is, so I have these two things called patching and hacking. These are two different ways to deal with challenges, to uh, legal challenges. So the, the missing husbands thing is a patch that uh, scholars in India came up with. So the problem was this. So there's a little bit of background you need to know. It has to do with codification of law. Maybe we can get to that a little later. But what happened was with the, when the British came into India is that they figured, hey, you, we need to rule by your law. Can you give us your law so that we can rule by it uh, when you have civil cases? You're welcome, by the way. Like, we're so enlightened, we'll, be, we'll do this for you. And Islamic law doesn't work like that. These, these books that Muslim scholars were writing weren't meant to be legal binding laws. Um, 
but they have no choice. And they say, okay, well, in the, so for, for instance, in the case of when a woman's husband goes missing, how long does she have to wait before she can get married again? The, the, the legal problem was that in the school of law that was popular in India, a woman cannot get a divorce from her husband on her own, like a unilateral divorce. The husband has to give her a divorce or she has to ransom herself. It's all very, like, a, uh, with the understanding that this book of law will then be taken to a judge and the judge will make up, probably his, own mind uh, about whether the, the party should get a divorce or not. So these books of law didn't always take into account reality. They were like these aspirational, internally consistent books of law that didn't necessarily make sense outside of the, the book itself. So they were trying to say, okay, if assuming that a wife cannot get a divorce from, cannot divorce herself from her husband, and her husband goes missing, how long should she wait before a judge can say, eh, he's probably not coming back, let's, let's just give you a divorce. And so they figured, okay, a woman can't be married to two men at the same time. So if her husband goes missing for like, let's say a month, and she's like, all right, I'm gonna go get remarried, and then the husband comes back, then she's married to two men at the same time. Can't have that. So like, it's not fair to just like, say, well, you can never get remarried if your husband goes missing, but there's gotta be like some kind of sweet spot between never and like a week before a judge can say, all right, you can get remarried now. So the Hanafi scholars thought, the Hanafi Indian scholars thought, and they were like, okay, um, she should probably wait until such time that she's really sure that he's never coming back. And so they were like, well, what's the longest time? And it was like, well, we've never heard of someone who lives past 120 years old. So, and then you don't get married at birth, you probably get married around 20, 30. So like, if, her, if uh, your husband goes missing and he doesn't come back for 90 years, then you're pretty sure he's not coming back and you can get remarried again, right? So they wrote this in their book of law, knowing that this was not a binding law. It was, it was an internally consistent argument. You take it to a court and a woman says, you know, my husband's been gone for like three years. The judge is like, wow, that's a long time. All right, we'll give you a divorce. But now when the British came in, they said, no, no, we're, this is your law. So we're gonna rule by this law now. So the law in early colonial British India was if your husband goes missing, you have to wait for 90 years before you can get remarried again. Um, so this was obviously a huge problem and Muslim scholars were like, okay, we gotta figure out how to, how to get around this. And the, the problem, the underlying problem is that a woman cannot divorce herself unilaterally. And that's not just one law. That's several laws that are found throughout this fifth book. Like you might find it in child custody, uh, chapters on child custody or on inheritance or on divorce and marriage. And so this is a pretty solid principle inside the book of law. So they're like, okay, we, we, it would take forever to try to figure out how to unpack this. So instead, what we'll do is, there's this other school of law that's pretty popular in West Africa. And they believe that a, a woman can get remarried after four years. So they said, we're in a time of necessity, we'll just patch our law with this other law and it, it'll work for the time being. And it did, it worked. It, it, for the rest of colon the colonial period, the divorce, uh, the, the, the law was you can wait four years. If your husband is gone for four years, um, you, you can get, uh, the judge will grant you a divorce. But that's like a lame solution. The, the problem that was, that was underlying the, the whole movement to begin with is that men and women should both have a unilateral access to divorce. That requires more than just a patch and saying, oh, this person says four years. What it requires is going back through all of those chapters and saying, you see what this original author said, it's 90 years. What he really meant was, and then go back into the inheritance chapter and says what they really meant was, and then go to child custody and say what they really meant was, and reread the whole book every time you come to divorce to say, actually women are allowed to unilaterally divorce their husbands. And actually they did it. The Council of Islamic Ideology in Pakistan, they took many, many years and they figured it out. But that's the difference between a hack and a patch. A patch is something you just slap on, it solves the problem in the near term, but it doesn't actually reflect the belief that's animating the movement in the first place. Um, and so, 
Hacking the law provides an abiding change, something much more lasting and, and reflective of beliefs, but it also takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So thank you so much. Um, so I, I think we've been relatively successful here in introducing you to <coughs> some of the main concepts. And um, so I'm going to invite you just to have a, a, a little moment of introducing yourself to your neighbor. Um, maybe you can have a conversation about some of the key issues that have emerged for you in the exchange that, we'll have, that we've had so far. And then we're going to invite Sarah uh, to me onto the stage. And um, so we're going to give you about three minutes to do that. It's like a scene change. Uh, but we, we don't want to kill the lights here. So talk to each other and we'll um, see. Um, so we're going to take uh, about half an hour to have a conversation here, and then um, hopefully there'll be plenty of opportunity for, for dialogue again, um, you know, with, with perhaps some new people, and then we'll leave about half an hour um, for question and answer and more general discussion, try to, to make that as rich as possible. Okay. Um, so we'll be to have you on the stage. Um, I'm wondering if you can. Uh, not anymore. No? Just sneeze anytime you like. Right? Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, about the work that, that you've done, particularly the field work that you did in, in northern Nigeria, and uh, how it touches, it might touch upon some of the themes that have, have been discussed so far. Sure. Um, Ruby, would you like me to tell the story that we were talking about earlier regarding the field work? Do you think? I think. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, I well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really excited to be here. I love Ruby's book. I wrote a commentary about it, and um, I, I find it very interesting on many levels. So this is really an honor. It's very fun. It's so relevant, and it's not every day, sadly, that we get to have these kinds of conversations. So I appreciate the invitation. My book is on um, a moment in northern Nigeria that began in 1999 when people started taking to the streets in the hundreds of thousands demanding the strictest possible iteration of Islamic law. So literally, we want stonings, we want hand amputations, we want um, the strictest possible form of Islamic law. Now there are two contexts that made me become interested in this case. At the time, I was working in Washington, D.C. for an American Muslim organization um, this was about two years after 9-11, and I, I think of it as triage, you know, in a hospital, right? So it was the emergency room. People were being kind of disappearing, and there were a lot of, of issues. And I remember being, and in fact, in 2002, I was sitting in a meeting in Washington, D.C., and the mood at the time was preparation for the Iraq War, in which the conversation in North America, or in the United States particularly, was there was no question whatsoever that at least 100,000 Iraqi civilians were going to be killed, right? That was not even a debate. The question was when, right? Not if. And so that was a very uh, stark and depressing and horrifying sort of environment to be in, and the, and the question was, are there weapons of mass destruction, are there not? And that was the conversation and the climate at the time. One day as I was discussing this in a meeting, um, my phone kept ringing, I was a media director, and um, it was one media outlet after another asking me to explain women's rights and stoning in the Islamic tradition. Why? Because there was a woman in northern Nigeria who had been sentenced to death by stoning for committing zina, or illegal sexual activity, and the sort of whole um, American press corps was extremely concerned about the life of this one African woman who was being um, you know, subjected to barbaric medieval Islamic law. And could I comment on that? Now, um, I cared about her life as much as, well, I think more than <laughs> the majority of that press corps. Um, but, but um, uh, to be honest, but you know the, the stark contrast between the absolute concern for this one woman's life versus the kind of blasé attitude about the civilians that were about to be killed in Iraq 
was something that I uh, certainly noticed and, and took note of. At the same time, I walked back into this meeting of, of kind of prominent American Muslim leaders, um, many of whom were Arab or South Asian in origin, uh, upper middle class, upper class, economically, and I asked them, um, is stoning in Islamic law? Is stoning in Islam? And the vast majority said to me, no, that's just something that happens in Africa. Now that's not true. That's not empirically true, and it's not true in terms of the Islamic legal tradition. So I knew that we had a problem on our hands here, <laughs> and I decided to um, undertake the research for this book as a result of that. So uh, fast forward many years, I ended up uh, writing my PhD dissertation on that case and doing field work in northern Nigeria, where I talked to people about that question, well, why did you march onto the streets at starting in 1999 asking for hand deputations and stonings? And what I found was very similar to Rumi's findings, um, which was not because they were born Muslim and therefore have to follow quote unquote Islamic law or fifth minded Islamic law to the letter. That is not what, oh, that is not what real people told me, okay? Um, real people told me that they were on the streets because they were so tired of the poverty and corruption of the government that they wanted in the words of one of the interlocutors, we want the laws of God where the laws of man have failed. So if it's going to take threatening a governor, not a peasant woman, a governor, if it's going to take threatening power with, a, with stoning, then that's what they wanted, right? And so um, that was so clear to me in the, the findings of the field work that I began to think differently about Sharia versus fiqh. And I, I began to see that distinction as extremely important especially in the post-colonial era. And I guess we can get into that a little bit more, specifically. Okay. Actually, that's my next uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't fed the questions, but somehow. Um, maybe you could, you could just say a little bit um, more about this tension between the, the fluidity and the codification, because I think that that's really Key, or one of the key issues here. Um, and, and what does this look, what is the, the, the attempt to codify? I mean, we know what the British did in, in India and Nigeria, similar to Nigeria. Um, and you know, then we have the emergence of, of nation states that to some extent have kind of continued this inheritance of the, of the codification. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about that, that transition from the colonial era to the nation state era where in some sense that kind of competing loyalties, um, you know, that, that you have a, a duty or a responsibility or fealty to your religion, but now also, um, you know, responsibilities to your national identity and, and um, you know, what are the tensions between those two competing identities? Well, it's a long story and I'm at risk of talking too long about the intricacies of Nigeria. And that's one of the interesting things is that while there are similarities between India and Nigeria and um, other post-colonial states, there are also important differences. So that's another area in which it's difficult when you get the media call, what does Islam say about X? It's like, um, if you want an accurate answer, it's pretty hard to generalize. But in the case of Nigeria, um, the British, you know, I, I have a, a sort of pet theory that the process of colonization often begins with first economic interests, uh, establishing business and economics, and then a political layer is laid on top of that to protect the economic interests, and then the final step is military. And that's how it played out in Nigeria. So by 1903 was when the military conquest of, of northern Nigeria was complete. In 1900, the vice regent of, of the British, whose name was Frederick Bugard, introduced a what was called the Native Courts Proclamation, which outlawed stoning as um, contrary to concepts of, quote, natural justice. Um, now, what this did in the work of Nigerian legal scholars, they call that legal warfare. 
against their um, legal system and really their cultural identity and community. Why? Because number one, we have no evidence that Nigerians were actually stoning anyone. And so the British coming along and outlawing it was purely a show of power that really had little to do with what was happening on the ground. And scholars of South Asia often draw an analogy here to Sati and what the British did with that practice. So um, that, that was there. But what it also did, you know, this is a little bit harder to prove, but so the, after 1903, the colonial era began in earnest. And then the British uh, finally left in 1965 when Nigeria became a state. And these post-colonial states, in many ways, Nigerians have a lot of national pride, but at the same time, in a lot of ways, they don't make a lot of sense in terms of languages, ethnicities, and it causes problems. Um, you know, the word Nigeria itself is rumored to have been named by the vice regent, British vice regent's wife sitting on a rocking chair saying, Niger area. Oh, okay. Well, you know, so it's, it's difficult. Um, so, um, there was a kind of gentleman's agreement, and I use that gender terminology, you know, on purpose. There's a gentleman's agreement in Nigeria in terms of power sharing. Much of the resources of the country are in the south in terms of petrol, uh, and a lot of the cultural power is in the south because Christianity came in through uh, maritime conversion to the south. The north um, is more arid and is majority Muslim. So the north did not have as much economic and cultural power. But what they did have was political power. So with, with a very small exception, all of the presidents of Nigeria from 1965 onward were Muslims. Starting in 1999, that was the first time that Nigerians elected a Pentecostal Christian president that flipped the balance of power in Nigeria. It is the same year that Muslims then took to the streets. And, and so they, many Muslims in Nigeria will deny that this is the case or that there's a relationship I had, as an analyst, I think there is a relationship. So they took to the, to the streets in that year and started actually calling into question the legitimacy of the Nigerian state and saying, this is actually a colonial construct in the first place and we want to go back to our laws. Now to go back to your question about codification, that moment led to a kind of overnight writing up of Islamic penal codes that suddenly went from books and books and books on what you need to know jurisprudentially to apply to stoning punishment to literally bullet points. And so when that kind of reductionist process happens with the law, then in my opinion, that's how, one of the reasons you see this explosion in the stoning punishment, um, both vigilante and legal. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just say, both of you, to, to comment on what's this experience like then on the ground for the, for the average one and, and that in, in uh, a situation where, I mean, you write about Pakistan, for instance, and you know, the, the, uh, the laws that have been um, brought into being. Um, what's the experience of, of you know, the average common person as they are shaped by this um, legal, legal tradition? I mean, I don't know about you, I, I feel like not much. Like, as far as the day-to-day -day goes, mm -hmm. you don't really interact with Islamic law unless you choose to or you're going to court. Most people don't go to court. Uh, I would think that the major impact is this belief that Islamic law is supposed to be on a state level at some point, which is a very modern belief, but it's a sincere belief. People believe it now. And we have Sharia source laws now in constitutions of 30 Muslim majority countries. And so the conversation of it has you should shifted. Say what a, what a is for yeah, sure. So I mean, it's like the, the Nigerian um, experience is, is so reflective of so many other uh, nation states, Muslim majority nation states, in that there is this belief that like Sharia, where where the laws of humans, is particularly the British, the French, the Italians, the Belgians, were crazy oppressive and led to mass death millions upon millions of, of lives lost. Sharia can bring like salvation and it, it, you know like the way people talk about or at least the, when they were writing about what Sharia will bring. It's like Sharia, when we have Sharia there people won't go hungry and you know kids will be nice to their parents 
I know the roads will be will be smooth. Um, all of these things were were written down in in, in texts and saying like basically Sharia will will solve our problems for us. And so anti-colonialist movements were touting Sharia and saying when when if you support us, we will bring Sharia back. And then the colonists were driven out, and they're like, what do we do now? And one of the, the quickest ways that people found out, and, and the way that, that power figured out how to use Sharia on the state level, is what are known as Sharia source laws, which are clauses in constitutions. And they either look like a guarantee or a repugnancy clause. And a Sharia guarantee clause says that all laws made in this nation will abide by Sharia. And a repugnancy clause says that there will be no law passed in this country that uh, is repugnant to or violates Sharia. And then the open question is, well, who decides what Sharia is? And so the, the state basically decides. And they have different apparatuses. Some have councils, some have Sharia courts that then decide what Sharia is. Um, and it, va it vastly varies from country to country. Uh, if you take any law that like has a set number on it, like a minimum marriage age or something, you see from, from country to country, the Sharia is completely different and arbitrary. And it never changes unless the powerful somehow need it to change. And somehow, whereas you know, the, the Sharia courts couldn't find a way to take stoning out of the, uh, the, uh, out of the laws of the land, they'll find a way to say blockchain technology and cryptocurrency is perfectly Sharia compliant, or finance is Sharia compliant, or any time the state needs something, they find a way to have their courts, uh, you know, determine a way that that, uh, that it abides by Sharia. Now, those court cases affect the discourse. It's not like if you're an average person, it doesn't really affect you, um, but it does affect the way that you speak and you understand yourself and your nation in the world. I think that's one thing. Yeah, um, I I wrote a distinction in the book um, between political Sharia and idealized Sharia. Very similar. So the idea is that people think Sharia is going to pave the roads and um, have fair distribution of zakat, and there are, you know, any very beautiful values that many of us, socialistic values, really, <laughs> interestingly enough. I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't hear, oh, it's a free market very often. That's, that's an interesting <laughs> side note. I don't know what's a, I didn't, you know, it's, it's just a side note. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really welfare state kind of language. Um, so it seems important to me on the level of everyday people that there's this idealized space in which there's a, a kind of perfect society that Islam is capable of generating on earth. And people need that space to remain pure, even as an ideal. Um, and then Nigerians are the ones who termed uh, who coined the term political sharia. The attempt to concretize that idealization through courts, um, through fiqh, that immediately became what they called political and ineffective and therefore not really sharia. Um, and so, you know, in the Nigerian case, there's a sense in which the minute you got the trained in fiqh people who write books about what gelatin is, with all due respect, involved in these um, you know, life and death issues on the ground is the minute that people kind of wash their hands and say, well, this, is not, this can't be real Sharia. This isn't what we're really talking about. So uh, the question then of why do we maintain this authority of, um, of fiqh-minded Sharia scholars in the face of such a difference in what people actually want is one of the reasons I was really, you know, grateful to Rumi for writing this because it is important. Yeah. So, what, um, in the interest of time, I have about fifty questions here. So, um, but I, I want to, I kind of dive back into the to, to the text and ask you maybe a little bit more of an abstract uh, question. So, on, on page fifty-four of the book, Rumi, you write, uh, "The law is part of a bigger historical and cosmic order." And so aligning yourself with the law means aligning yourself with history and the cosmos. Success comes from finding one's place within that order, not subverting it. Um, so I'm wondering how you know how you how you read that, 
and particularly how you read that in, in the light of you know experiences of, of Nigerian women. I mean, you've, you've written quite eloquently about about um, you know women in Nigeria, their experiences. I'm thinking particularly in the article, the difficulty of accounting for women who critique the, the Sharia. But what about for folks like that? What does it mean to attempt to align oneself with this? I think particularly in this moment where you know we're we're in a rights-based moment and much of the, the, the Sharia to my own reading of your book and um, other sources is about duties is about it. So there's a, I think there's a tension here between rights and duties. Anyway, I'm wondering if you can comment on aligning yourself with the cosmos. Well, um I, when I wrote the commentary on Rumi's book, I actually focused on that a little bit because as an individual, the idea of aligning oneself with the cosmos through fiqh is a difficult one for me. Through Islam, it's possible, you know, in various different ways, but through that specific practice of fiqh, uh, and you know, we were just chatting about, you know, Rumi started by talking about his I should I be calling you Professor Ahmed? No. I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. Okay, call me Sarah, please. Oh, okay. Whoops. Okay. Well, we were chatting at the beginning, of, or you were saying at the beginning that you know that this is motivated by your love for the community, and um, I think as a female gendered person, I didn't, as you pointed out, you know, I just didn't have that same uncomplicated relationship. So I think I carry that into my perception of filth as something that is not really meant for me, written for me, written by me, you know. Um, so that's me. Now, in terms of the women that I was trying to write about in northern Nigeria, um, you know, I that article that you're referring to is kind of material that didn't make it into the book. And it's about women who talk to me about how, the same thing. How they just didn't feel that any of this had anything to do with them, um, and that uh, if they wanted to critique it, there's no real cultural space for them to do so. They consider themselves Muslim, but in their own particular way, and they do not see the the fifth scholars or the scholars as representing them or their interests. At least these women I spoke to but there was no cultural space in which to voice that objection without being called, in the case of, of Northern Nigeria, and I think many other spaces, you know, um, someone who is, I don't know, in line with the colonizers or a Western stooge or whatever names people are called, when you simply say, you know, I don't, this has nothing to do with me, right, and, and what my values are. Um, and, which is just a factual statement in many ways. It's a factual statement. It is not a female-centered um, tradition. So, um, so, the, so those, so you know, it's difficult as a. I'm not an anthropologist by training, but I was doing a form of anthropology while I was there. And it's difficult as an analyst to tease out. You know, sometimes people say things to you, and it's kind of the official line. Right? There are rules and regulations of what you're allowed to say and not say. So I feel like the official line is Islam is perfect, Islam solves all problems, all solutions can be found within Islam. And then the question is, what is Islam in that formulation? And then, but I was trying to talk about that kind of more unofficial moments. So these were when I was in people's living rooms or in their office with only women, you know, and I have their permission to, to I, I changed their names. But, in a sense, this is a kind of snapshot of what a lot of these women really thought, you know, that, well, you know, while these men are off having these discussions, I don't know where my husband is at night. I don't know if he's married someone else. He hasn't told me. I don't know if he has a disease. I don't, these are what our people are worried about. I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. I'm completely dependent on this system that um, is not working for me. And I don't feel that I have allies in this system. I think, um, you know, I was, when, uh, if I'm remembering that quote correctly, I was precisely thinking about this context. 
in that most Muslims don't feel that Fiqh speaks to them. And it's not relevant to them, and it's not written to them. And you know, the, the largest group of, and you know, when I was, I was alluding to earlier, that I'm the normative subject of Fiqh. Like, Fiqh assumes a privileged male, uh, usually South Asian Arab male. Um, and everyone else is pretty much excluded from it. And so if, you're, if you have, if Fiqh isn't speaking to you, then why would you get involved with it uh, at all? The problem there is that those who, Fiqh-minded individuals have actual state power today. And they have soft power here in North America. They run the communities. And what happens is if the rest of us are not engaged in conversation with them, then they get to answer that question of what is Islam. And they speak for the rest of us. And so what I was hoping to do was to get folks to, to feel like they could speak this language, even if it's not speaking to them, that they own this language. It's the, if you're a Muslim, you get to talk about Islamic law. Let me tell, teach you how to do it in a way that is authoritative to those conversations where they're defining Islamic law. And the biggest impediment to that is that Islamic law actually doesn't make sense. And it's, it doesn't make sense by design. There's like a, there's something that we, we learned like early on in Madrasa, there was like a, there's a line that you're taught, which is that if Islamic law is supposed to make sense, we would wipe on the bottom of our socks. And that's like a, a line you hear over and over again. Uh, anytime you question, you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. You're like, yeah, well, if Islamic law was supposed to make sense, we would wipe on the bottom of our socks. And you just, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So it refers to, it refers to ablution, because like you're supposed to wash your feet before you pray. Um, but if you're on, if you're traveling or if you're on a journey and you don't want to have to take off your socks, instead of taking off your socks and washing your feet, you can just take some water on your hand and wipe on top of your sock. But that doesn't make any sense because like your sock is dirty from the bottom. But if Islamic law was supposed to make sense, we would wipe on the bottom of our socks. So like that's the point. It's like it doesn't have to make sense. It just has to be internally consistent. It has to 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 work within this larger framework of Islamic law. And so you can reinterpret the text so that it's still internally consistent, and it's a, you, and this new interpretation still works within the text. And the, that's really hard for people to wrap their heads around, because it sounds so hypocritical. Like, you can change the law as long as you don't say that you're changing the law, and it still makes sense um, within the text. And it's hard to explain that I don't feel that as hypocrisy. Like, from a religious context, that's just religion. You know, like, where you have this new interpretation based on the new time and place that you're in that nobody saw before, but that speaks to you, that's religion. So, like, you know, signs of the Day of Judgment is probably the best example I can think of. Like, you go to any halakha, they have their signs of the Day of Judgment thing. It's like, you know, the Antichrist will ride on a, a steed that has 40 eyes and has fire in its belly. Well, that's obviously a plane. You know, like hundred years, nobody said it was a plane. Like in all the texts that you read from hundreds of years ago, nobody says it was a plane because there were no planes. But nobody says, well, that's hypocritical that you, you know, have this very convenient interpretation because now there are planes. That's just the way that that a religious context operates in. And when you're in this like madrasa setting with a bunch of guys, dudes sitting around, it's like kind of cool. You're like, hey, I figured out how to make cryptocurrency work. Like, check this out. It's actually like a really, uh, it's on my mind now because Bahrain, the Sharia Council in Bahrain recently uh, sanctioned cryptocurrency. And the way that they did it, cryptocurrency, by the way, the reason why it's a big deal is because it goes against every Islamic finance law of the last 13, 1400 years. Like, it is so wrong on so many levels. It does not work because you, it's, it's like even worse than fiat currency from like, anyway, I'm a nerd. So like, the, the reason things I think about, the way that they did it was they, they looked at, um, uh, what's the word? It's a transfer of rights rather than an actual currency. So there's a ledger where your name is written down that you own this many uh, coins of this particular currency. And so any cryptocurrency that uses a ledger, when you're, what you're actually buying is the space on the ledger. And then if you sell it, you're not selling the currency, you're transferring the rights to that space on the ledger. And so in fact, that's just sale. That's not cryptocurrency. And the cryptocurrency is simply the means by which you're doing a sale. Got it, like solved. We can do that same thing, that same like exciting feeling for all of the other values that we hold dear. 
such as gender equality, uh, such as um, economic uh, uplift, any other value that you hold deal, that's simply the way that it works. Me. But no, they, those do this hacking that I'm talking about because the laws already privilege them. They need people whom the laws currently don't privilege to speak back to them and to hold them account for the laws that they're promoting. You know, I, uh, I was at a mosque yesterday. Yes, yesterday. Uh, I brought some students to, I'm teaching African studies class right now, and I brought some students to a very conservative, mostly African attended mosque. And the khutbah was actually precisely about how laws should not ever change and um, how true Islam was about following the letter of the law, even if it means washing the top of your socks. And on one hand, you know, if you think about the literature in our field, there's this whole literature about embodiment and about how just the that piety can be expressed through the sheer repetition of these types of practices that may not make logical sense. And that's a very popular sub-discourse. Another compelling kind of idea is that in the post-colonial world, in post-colonial societies, when so much was destroyed, right, when, when land was taken away, when there was military intervention, that in a sense, uh, all that is left is Islamic law this pillar, you know, by which uh, there are rules and regulations and it's safe and it's clear and it's what we have that keeps us together as a community. As and um, I, th I remembered that idea of structural engineering and Islamic law and the sanctity of it is all we have left in the post-colonial you know, rubble um, when I was at this mosque yesterday with this community of, of um, people who were taking time out of their extremely busy day, often driving an Uber or working in the, you know, in this, what's it called, the gig economy, you know, where maybe they, many of them don't have benefits and many of them brought their families to the prayer, et cetera. And um, I'm wondering how we speak also to those kinds of communities when we, because like often when, when we talk about how we want to do this kind of hacking and we want to be more inclusive, I think that can be seen by those types of communities as an elitist discourse, right? And there's some kind of, I mean, I would like to think of ways to include those communities that actually find comfort and safety in the rules as they are. Um, even if I think you clearly demonstrated that that in, in itself is a construction. Yeah. Well, can I get your thoughts on this? It's like, okay, so there's a few things that I'm thinking when I hear that. Is that first, we want to include those communities, but those communities have all the power in the Islamic law conversation. We're like trying to wedge our way in it's true. and say, you know, you kind of marginal community as you are, like I can't quit you. Like I keep, I keep coming back to you uh, and I want you to let me in on my own terms. Um, because yeah. I, I don't believe that I'm a bad Muslim, even if your interpretation of Islamic law doesn't include me. So that's the, that's the first part. The second part is all of those people who are going to the masjid are already hacking the law because their mm -hmm. Jummah is not valid. Their khut, the, that khutbah is not a khutbah because there's no caliph to appoint the khabib. And there's no adhan that's coming from a mosque. So technically it's not a mosque. So if you're not going to a mosque and the imam wasn't appointed, your Jummah isn't valid, but nobody there feels like my Jummah is not valid. Mm -hmm. My Friday prayer, they feel they've hacked the law so that their Friday prayer is valid, even though it goes against 1,300 years. Did they hack um, it, or did they just ignore it? Well, see, that's, <laughs> they, that's a, well, they figured out a way to yeah. make what they believe to be the truth to be enough. And we ignore things all the time. You're exactly right. But like, I was watching Ilhan Omar the other day, like, give her acceptance speech, and it was so amazing. New Congresswoman. Oh yeah, sorry. This is an yes. more American. A uh, new congresswoman from Minnesota, Somali Muslim, she wears a hijab, she gave this amazing acceptance speech about like how she's, uh, her task is to lift us all up and we're going to continue to work for equality and that is the, that is the goal of her and, her and all, and she was like, we are all in this together. And I couldn't help but watch that and be like, man, she couldn't give a chutbah in a, in a mosque. She's not even allowed to walk through the front door of so many masjids. She has to go through this, uh, Ilhan Omar. 
And I have to imagine that there are Muslims who are watching that who are so proud of her and who feel uplifted by her and wouldn't give it a second thought if she was the person giving the khutbah, mm. and if she walked in the front door, and if she led us in prayer. Like, I don't think, I think there are a lot of people who don't care, mm -hmm. but those people are excluded from the conversation right now. And I think that in the, that one of the, the thing that we, Islam, we will always have Islamic law, but our greatest asset is our community. And the whole point of this religion is our community. And if we are not bringing in the majority of our community, then it's, it's our Islamic law that's failing. The Islamic law is the problem with that. And it's not a problem in a, in a conceptual sense, it's the way that we're practicing that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, that's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. and I, but that might be hopelessly naive. And no, it's, wrong. it's not naive, it's, it's very loving of the community, and it's very expansive in terms of what you think the community is. Because I think a lot of people at this point self-exclude, you know. So they, you know, when you said you don't consider yourself a bad Muslim, uh, I think a lot of people do consider themselves bad Muslims if they're not doing what X, Y, Z people tell them is the law, or they just say, well, I guess I must not. Well, I'll think about it later because obviously I'm not doing what they're saying because that makes no sense to me, which is a thought I had at the age of five. I mean, to be perfectly honest, so I mean, like literally. You know, um, so okay. Well, I don't want to throw this away completely, but I'll, I'll come back to it later. So um, I think it would take some repair work culturally in the community to even get. I would say the majority to even think that they could be good Muslims or Muslims at all, Muslims at all slash good Muslims, and um, follow the law. Well, I, I agree with you completely on that there's like a lot of work to be done. And I think we have a head start with all of this, like uh, with these Sharia source laws, as, as much havoc as they wreak. Having Sharia on a state level, the unintended consequence of that is that all Muslims, as by dint of being a citizen, have a say in Sharia. So like Dr. Zubo Mir Husseini, she says, uh, uh, what's the quote? Um, Islamic feminism is the unwanted child of political Islam. Because at the moment you put uh, Islam on a state level, all of a sudden, everyone gets a say in what Islam is. And so people were saying, oh, I'm a citizen of this state, I'm a feminist, I sh my, my voice should be represented. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the concern that I have is that we give up our power if we don't use it. And we, we do have it, but we so willingly give it up because they say, Islamic law never changes, we are the authorities, and of course the state is perfectly happy to endorse that, but we don't have to believe them, just because that's what they say. Mm -hmm. But even in non-state contexts, like like in the West, right, where you know the Sharia is not part of the law, um, what is the mechanism by which, I guess my question is, yeah, okay, so how, hmm. it's a very complicated thing, right? Because so, so many of us in that have done PhDs in Islamic studies, for example, the, many of us started out as uh, reformers, like, you know, you want to, and, and the goal was to learn, to, to not see, exactly as you said, not see the playing field to people who you disagree with, you should actually learn the terms of the debate, but then there's a sense in which, you know, by the time I studied stoning for seven years, you know, you, I, you find yourself saying things, kind of like your Madessa's experience, like, you find yourself saying things like, well, but you know, uh, kind of defending stoning, you know, because it, it's just, because yeah. like, you know, after how many months of studying it, you're like, well, but it's impossible. That these are up. And it's true, it is impossible to prove it, except that it isn't, because it keeps happening, especially in post-modernity. So I, I, I guess I'm a little bit worried that it's very hard to get yourself so mired in that conversation and come out the a semblance of what you once were, okay. right? I mean, what do you, what yeah. do you think about when, well, I'm wondering okay. if, yeah. if we might just turn that question over to, to the collective, yeah. to the group. Um, so, and just because of the time, and I've come back to it maybe as a result. So what, what we'd like you to do is to, you know, again, discover some, some new people, people you haven't met before. And 
and um, I want to come back to the to the question of, of you know do you own your Islamic law and what does that mean to you um, both as a as a Muslim and um, as someone who maybe has another practice and then to I think this this question that is that has come up here um, and then also what are the limits of hacking. I mean, one of the things that you, you write about is that hacking takes time, right? Um, that it, that you know, it involves a lot of learning, and you know, Sarah, you've kind of spoken to that, seven years of kind of immersing yourself in a particular subject area. So is it still the province of, of the elite? What, what are the Uber drivers to do? I mean, they're, they're driving all day, and I'm sure they have multiple jobs. How, how can we bring folks who don't have so much time into the conversation in a meaningful way. So we want to give you maybe 10 minutes to have those conversations, and then we'll regather and then have a, uh, an old-fashioned Q&A. <laughs>
circumvent, it, you know, it, it, that says something also about the hacking project because the hacking project also, it is participating in a discourse that has been majority male. So you would need to get a lot of people on board to kind of do this painstaking work. And I'm just thinking about Layla, like, about Layla's work, Layla Ahmed's work of like, do I want to spend my time reading through uh, all kinds of arcane legal texts that argue that I'm a second class citizen, you know, uh, akin to property and livestock, <laughs> and hack that? Do I want to spend my time on earth doing that? You know what I'm saying? Um, so, <laughs> there's limited time here, right? So, so yeah, what do you think of that like, personal space? I have, I have a lot. Like, okay. You said so much. Okay. That, like, <laughs> Like so much deep yeah. stuff, and um, okay. I'm having a little trouble yeah. wrapping my head around. So to the, to the first part, I love the juxtaposition you make of Leila and some of them. I'm like, what is the what is the task of religion? Is ultimately the question. Because like on the one hand, I could you, you know you can have this kind of flip answer and say, yeah yeah, in the West it's okay to say it's intimate, but you know in the quote unquote West, but like in many Muslim majority countries, you get a card that says your religion on it, and you go to court based on what your card says. And so there are certain, uh, or like in Malaysia, you get a 10% discount on your mortgage if you're a Muslim. Um, so so there's also intimate. Well, right? that's that's exactly the point. Is that that's kind of like the dismissive answer that people yeah. give. But so, so I have to say that it's not it's not a deeply intimate enterprise. Nonetheless, I'm like, how often do you go around getting mortgages, or like going to court, or using your ID card? And you know, the 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 Lala said some Mahmoud thing of, well, that's a Western conception. Uh, and that actually there is this authority structure presumes that the task of religion is to create orthodoxy or to create some kind of authority. For a lot of people, religion isn't that for them. It's something that they are or something that they do or something that they maybe think about sometimes, maybe that they don't other times. And so I think we need to expand our notion of what it means to be religious. And I, I want to take my cues from the community. I mean, like, like I do love the community. And I'm proud of our community. And every time there are polls that come out about Muslims, it's like really phenomenal. Like 90% of Muslims believe in religious freedom, or like the vast majority of Muslims believe in gender equality. Most Muslims don't believe in stoning, um, mm -hmm. according to the 2013 poll. It was like 80% don't think that we should we should stone people. And uh, from my reading of the Prophet's life, his practice was one of deep consultation at all times. And he said, you know, my community won't agree upon error. And I believe that. I believe that our community ultimately does the right thing. And that we have, you know, those same polls say that most Muslims are deeply skeptical of their religious establishment. And so I trust in the wisdom, the collective wisdom of our community. And if they're saying this is an intimate thing to me, then that's what it is. And if a small group of people are saying, no, it's not, it's this like, well, then I'm skeptical of that small group. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to um, clarify. Maybe I can express what I meant by intimately personal. I'm, I'm not saying that, um, that you know, I believe or I think what I think, and, and you can do this on your way. Not at all. I am Muslim, and, and there are like a certain set of, you know, general rules that you follow as a Muslim. But, you know, if I believe that for, for me, it works that, you know, not to wear a hijab, for example, um, that is a very personal sort of agreement with my God, right? That, that's, that's what I meant. I don't know if it... So, I but actually, right. that, that's a great segue to your second question to me, which was, um, what was it? Oh, shit. Um, shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, um, I think there's a thousand questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not sure it was really, really good. Um, and, and yeah, no, no, it's not your fault. Uh, it's in fact you were you were triggering me to to respond to to what why should we spend the time? Thank you. <laughs> why should we, why should we spend the time yeah. on on doing this? So. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, going back to Henry's question of what are the limits, theoretically, there are no limits. Everyone keeps asking me, like, you know, what, how far can you hack things? Like, what, uh, define the practices that, 
to, that have, are the boundaries of hacking. And people don't believe me when I say, honestly, I believe nothing. There is one God, Muhammad is the messenger of God. Those are the boundaries. Beyond that, there is an Islamic legal argument to be made about not wearing hijab. But that is a perfectly acceptable Islamic legal practice. I'll give you an example. So, like, women's clothing, for instance, is often divided based on what free women wear as opposed to what slave women wear. And slave women have the same aura, the same uh, part of the body that they have to cover that males do. Now we no longer have slavery. So people assume that the, that the dress code reverts to free women. And now people have to dress like free women. Well, why is that the case? Why doesn't the dress code for women revert to what used to be slave women? And there's an argument there to be made that the dress code for women should be the exact same as men. And that's a legal argument that can be made if people want to do it. But, but I, I want to take very seriously what you're saying about time. And essentially what you're saying is, and it's a very good criticism, that you're downloading the, this task of hacking, which requires a great deal of time to those people who are marginalized by the law already. Yeah. And you're saying, you do the work of, of this. And I think, I think you're right that it'll be compelling to those people, even if they don't have the time. But the people who have to do it are those who are privileged by the law. And so you're going to have to adopt, you know, Dr. Chaudhary says, those with privilege have to use it to lose it. Like, you have to take the time and the energy that you have and your familiarity with Islamic law and hack it so that you lose power. And that's... How many people are you going to find? <laughs> well, see, that's the religious project. Well, you yeah. know, the Quran says stand for justice even if it's against your own self. And religious Muslims who believe in that are going to have to engage in this project. And if they don't, or if they can, or they refuse to, well, then what are we doing here? Like, what, what is the point of our religion if it doesn't establish justice upon her? I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there were a couple of explicit questions uh, that were asked, and, and so I'm just wondering if you can respond to, so I think, you know, the gentleman over there had a question about the rationality of, of Islamic law. Is that a, a fairly yes. decent summation? And then uh, a question in the back around, you know, what, what business does the state have in involving itself in people's sexual rights, essentially. Yeah, sure, so I'll take the first one. I mean, it doesn't mean rationality, it means literally means understanding. Um, and the, the term was applied early on to works that dealt with theology, and, uh, the, like the Kitab al and things like that, about, about describing human beings' relationship to society and to God. But eventually it morphed into a genre of literature um, that has distinct chapters in what is often known as jurisprudence. So when I'm referring to fiqh, I'm not referring to the, the idea of understanding itself, but rather to this particular genre of literature which has meaning and has an entire apparatus built upon it over the last uh, millennia or so. Um, and the second one, I think you're more, far more qualified. Well, so. all states concern themselves with adultery, and right, you can, you can file for divorce in the US and uh, I mean, I know you can probably divorce in Canada. But you, can, you can cite adultery as grounds for divorce, right? So you can, but you don't have to. It also makes a difference in fault and providing uh, yeah. uh, assets, assets and based on all kinds of things. So that's a really deep question. Why does the state involve themselves? Why does Islamic law involve itself? Because Islamic law involves itself in in, in private. Well, in marriage, and that's a deep question, actually. So what, what is the role of marriage in the kind of wider conception of Islamic ethics? That's a whole other question. I actually want to say something else to you, or uh, pose something else, because I think a lot about, I did a minor field of <coughs> Jewish studies, and I think about how the Jewish community, which is far smaller, handled these kinds of questions of, because Jewish law is the best analogy to Islamic law, right? Uh, and there came a time in the late 19th century in Germany, right, where people said, uh, we are, don't want to keep kosher to the same degree, we don't want to follow the halakha to the same degree, we don't want our rabbis to have as much power as they do, we want to belong to the state, and etc. 
And what they did, at least in their context, was they just created new institutions and declared all of the law of religious literature. And, and now we have the reform movement, which is the largest denomination. It's not a great analogy because the numbers are so different, right? And I think there's a lot of differences. However, I always think about that other option, which I think is actually de facto what is happening right. in the Muslim community, that basically you have the vast majority opting out of the law altogether and declaring it religious literature in their own way um, and having their own, and, and basically sitting there ashamed of themselves or not knowing what to do, right? you know what I mean? Whereas in, the, whereas in the Jewish community, they actually formed institutions and called it something and, and now are, you know, talking about it and all that. So, um, I, again, it's, it's interesting because what you're suggesting is actually preserving the structural engineering. I mean, you are not throwing away the fifth at all. You are saying, let's keep at this project. What do you say about the fact that de facto most people are like, threw up their hands? Can, can I just get you to come back to that question at the end? Because I kind of, and, and we have so people who have better that. memories yeah. clearly than Remy and Remy. So we do have mics, and so if you if you want, uh, please come up to the mics and ask a, uh, ask a question. Okay. Oh. Okay. This is um, okay, I've never asked a question on one of these panels, so I'm not sure what the procedure is. I have to state my name. No? Just okay. as comfortable as you need to be. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wrote a lot of thoughts, and these are thoughts that I've been having for probably years now. Um, they're not very coherent, so I apologize for that. But um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with my question, and then I'll give background on it. Um, so my question is, what is the mechanism, or Rumi, you were talking about um, having discussions within the originating uh, or fic. Um, what is the mechanism by which reverts can be part of the conversation? Because, um, and this is gonna go back to my, my background here. So I am a revert, I am very happy, I think that um, my identity as a Muslim, I see that as um, authentic, uh, but I'm very aware of the fact that my identity may not be authentic to those people who hold the structures of um, not only Islamic law, but also Islamic practice, right? Because, um, you know, we talk about being in the masjid or the mosque and, and how that relates to us as women, how that is justified by historical um, Islamic law. Um, but those are things that we are not as involved in in discussions. And I think part of that is kind of accepted, you know, there are reverts that I'm sure we all know of, maybe we don't, but um, that accept the status quo, right? And they're embraced and they're seen as these lovely people as part of the, the community who were blessed with uh, choosing Islam. And then there are those of us that uh, perhaps um, don't go with the status quo. Again, what, what is the status quo is another question. Um, and we are seen as maybe reformers, uh, which has been a, a term thrown around here, or part of the colonial establishment. Um, so I guess my question goes to who can hack uh, who can hack Islamic law? Um, because often it does seem like it's even even that branch of hacking is um, limited to maybe South Asian or Arab Muslims, and I'm including women in that. Um, I don't see space for uh, reverts such as myself, who maybe come from other um, non-colonial but yet quote white backgrounds. Um, where is the space for us to? be enveloped in Islamic law, if this is an Islamic law for everyone, for the whole world, where do we become part of the conversation and yet respect the fact that um, this is like a body of knowledge that has historically and culturally meant something for other born Muslims? Um, 
So just finding the, the line between respect and yet wanting to be a part of the conversation and doing that research and, and that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to take that question, if you don't mind, and just like broaden it out a little bit to talk about patriarchy and racism. Um, the kind of hacking that I'm talking about, people are already hacking all the time. We are all hacking in order to be in this room. To use modern currency, we have been doing hacking. The kind of hacking that I'm talking about is one that is geared towards social justice and embodying some of the ideas that we have uh, in the Quran and in the life of the Prophet. Um, what that means is that people like me have to be seen less. Like, normally when you, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is change the definition or the ideas that we have about what makes a good practicing Muslim. And normally when we have people on stage representing Muslims, they're usually brown males, bearded males, or white bearded males um, who are champions uh, and lauded by those brown Muslim males. Um, what we need to do is change the, the um, what we think of when we think of a good Muslim, and that starts with having, first of all, more women, and especially black women, who are very often excluded uh, from, I mean, the, the history of Islam in North America is African and African American, and we almost never see them uh, on the stage. So what I'm trying to suggest is that when we are, ha what, what I'm advocating is that we take this hacking process that is already happening, and we use it to decenter ourselves. That includes race, that includes uh, gender, and it includes uh, coloniality. Now, all of us here are colonials in one sense or another. We are on stolen land, um, indigenous land, and we didn't ask permission to come here. And many of us came to Canada because those of us whose parents or grandparents came, came because Colonial powers made it so that we couldn't stay in the countries that we were in. And our parents, or we, or whoever had to come here. And then we got here and we're like, oh, those people who were signing our visa stamps, they didn't ask the people who were here whether we could come or not. And so when we're hacking Islamic law, as people in Vancouver, in this context, we have to be doing it in order to decenter ourselves. That includes, so if, if you as an individual, or we as a group, win exclusively through hacking, then we fail. We all have to win in this hacking conversation. So for instance, uh, prayer on stolen land, according to classical Islamic law, is invalid. So all of our prayers technically don't count while we're here. That is an opening for a conversation about how we can take responsibility for the fact that we're here in order to make ourselves better people and to honor those who are, whose land that we're on and try to uplift all of us at the same time. So I'm not trying to make space for individuals or certain groups, but to say, take less space for yourself. Hack the law so that it privileges you less and it privileges others more. So actively look for <coughs> communities that are more, that are more disempowered than you yeah. and look for ways to elevate them. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that just now. I should have put that in the book. But I <laughs> it's definitely implicit, but it's, it's yeah. yeah. No, that's, yeah. So, yeah. I'm conscious of the time, and I think we're up against the time. I just want to thank you and, and honor you for, for getting up and asking that question, and um, for us for holding uh, a space where it's possible for people to get up for the first time to the mic, um, for respectful conversation to take place, um, for opportunities to kind of meet with each other um, in the spaces that we created for this. Um, and you saw that I, in keeping with Rumi's um, notion of decentering, you saw that I left the speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another brown, uh, um, so I'm going to hand it over to all. I'll take over the speech. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presence. This event is for you and was conceived the way we did it for you. Uh, I hope you like the format. Uh, we welcome any feedback. As you can see, what we're trying to do is to create a space 
for the community, broadly speaking, not just the Muslim community. And uh, we're always uh, happy to hear from you. Uh, there are cards uh, with my name on, uh, on the table out there if you'd like to email and discuss anything uh, with me. Um, thank you, Yaqeen, Ben, and Mataz uh, for being here assisting in various ways. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rumi, and thank you, Hanif. Uh, I hope um, you had a good time with us. Uh, we have one event coming up on uh, November 21st, Women in the Education Revolution, speaking of women. And a somehow related topic on November 29th, the invention <coughs> of the idea of, uh, of the Muslim world as, as a geopolitical idea. Uh, sign up to our email, ccms at sfu.ca, if you'd like to receive uh, weekly uh, updates on, uh, sorry, on our events. And um, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll keep you uh, in, the, in the loop on what uh, we're doing. Thank you.